Welcome to the Bonhoeffer Project podcast. My name is Dan Lights. I am here with my co-host, Stephen Kimbrell. Hey, guys. And today we have a very special guest. I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to John Weaver. John, say hello to the folks. Hey, greetings, everyone. Thanks, Dan for, and Stephen, for having me. Absolutely. John, um, as Stephen and I have been talking kind of uh, uh, before we got here on the air, uh, just... Could you give us a little bit of your background? You've got uh, an amazing story, and I don't want to uh, taint it with my version of it. I'd just love to hear from you. Uh, give us a little bit of your background and your story. Well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I first heard the gospel when I was in high school, and I remember that very vividly. And But then I had the privilege of going to a Bible college, Welch College, and while I was there, I learned about unreached people groups, learned about the Great Commission, God's heart for the nations, and I started working with Muslims there in Nashville, Tennessee. But really the passion of my heart was I wanted to go to an unreached people group, someplace like Libya or Saudi Arabia or Iraq or Afghanistan. And then most people know a little bit about my story. I spent 16 years in, uh, in Afghanistan primarily because God's heart is for us as the church to make disciples of all nations, every ethnic group, Panta Ethne, and mm. Afghanistan's full of unreached people groups. And so I thought, well, I've got one life. Lord, I give it to you to make disciples among unreached people groups, specifically Muslims uh, in Afghanistan. And I've been involved in that region since about 1998. Wow. Well, yeah, we're just going to let that simmer that. for a moment. Wow. That's that's amazing. What what was that? I mean, just give us the gist. What was that like moving from Nashville to Afghanistan? What 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 did that look like in your life? Well, it was a big leap. Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, thankfully, you know, in prayer and in support of the local church, you know, God was preparing me with you know training, just people that were coaching and mentoring me and working with Muslims in the states and doing some short term trips. But when I launched out, actually, I left in 1997. When I launched out, I mean, it was like, Lord, here I am, you know, <laughs> <Yeah, that's laughs> take, awesome. whatever I, take whatever I have, you know. And, but, but specifically to Afghanistan, it was this passion to see Christ known there among the unreached. Mm -hmm. And it was very much, so just to give a little context, I mean, a strict Muslim context, you know, no expression of local church, you know, hardly any believers, very few scriptures that were even available in the you know in the local languages there so it very much we call it it was very much a pioneering an apostolic mm. pioneering disciple making uh, effort and it kind of completely rocked my world a lot of my paradigms that i you know grew up you know learning in church here in the states and even good training that i received i realized it wasn't exactly mm. the best way to to do pioneer disciple making among unreached muslims so a lot of it was unlearning, learning by trial and error, <laughs> making a lot of mistakes, and um, yes, and just dependence upon the Lord. I mean, it was a, you know, a volatile place, a war zone, a lot of persecution and suffering, and, and um, of course, the beautiful part, you know, Stephen, as you know, I don't know, if, you know, Dan, you were just meeting each other sure. here, and many people from the Bonhoeffer podcast that are listening to this, I met my wife in Afghanistan, so that's one of the beautiful parts of my own story was wow. not only seeing Muslims come to Christ and the seeing disciple making launched among unreached people groups, but God in his providence led us uh, together as two single international workers. And we fell in love there. We didn't go there to get married, but we got married there and had a big public Christ centered wedding where we openly shared the gospel because it was the, you know, the context of a wedding and sure. And hundreds, thousands of Afghans were involved in that. It was a whole week-long celebration. Wow. But uh, yeah, I could talk all day about stories. I've written books about it. Uh, some of the listeners might be aware of different books that I've written about my time in Afghanistan. Absolutely. You shared something just now that, uh, again, I, I almost, I, I have to explore it because if I don't, it's going to mess me up. You said there were some things that you had to unlearn and things that you had to relearn in a context of an apostolic ministry. Yeah like that what are some of those things that you had to unlearn because again you know we're we're very contextual right we've yeah. got our context you went from one context to a completely different i mean yeah. not even we're not talking from california to new york or or from the south to the coast you went from 
America to war torn country. Yeah. What were the things that you had to unlearn and then relearn? I, I'm, I'm before he starts, I'm just going to say, I'm thinking the same thing. I'm right. sitting here going, okay, so you don't go to <laughs> Afghanistan and, and put up a sign that says, hey, we got VBS right, on, right. You know, starting Sunday. <laughs> Anybody wants to come and you know, yeah, play yeah. games and learn about Jesus? So you really had to rethink some of those things. So yeah, yeah what did that look like? Yeah, so if we would have put a sign up saying VBS, they would have thought it was an immunization program or some <laughs> medical program, right? And uh and also, if we would have said on Sunday, that would have thrown them off because that yeah. was you know, one thing. And, and in many other countries, specifically Muslim countries, you know, part of Thursday evening or Friday or Saturday morning would be more, you know, advantageous times to do spiritual gatherings. Mm. Uh, whereas, you know, we're used to doing them on, you know, Sunday for mostly Sundays, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But some traditions on Saturday, but there it would have been Thursday and Friday. So that was something wow. was a big, already a big adjustment for me thinking, wait a second, these people have never seen a local church. So I can't talk about, mm -hmm. you know, my experience in a local church because it won't resonate with them. It sure. won't connect with them. They have no context. They have no pegs in their worldview to hang that information. And uh, yeah, so no, v no VBSs and I got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. You can't do Billy Graham crusades. <laughs> no. there. You can't do open, you know, things like that. So sure. a lot of my paradigms, even door to door evangelism, I love doing that in the States. And, uh, but even, even then I realized, you know, you, you can't do that. So now imagine where you guys are sitting right now. Imagine you're sitting on the floor, the table's not there, the chairs aren't there and you have a cup of tea, both of you, and you're meeting for the first time and you're starting to, you know, ask questions. So a lot of it was kind of like that. It was kind of like Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. Mm. We would have neighbors and co-workers, you know, come seek us out and ask spiritual conversations, starting kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Or it was me doing the work that I was, you know, humanitarian projects there. You find out God's at work, someone starting to ask questions, or you offer to pray for someone. So it was much more natural, organic, sometimes spontaneous, sometimes in the moment, sometimes relationally drinking tea, but it started more like we call it leaven in the dough. So instead mm. of anything public, mm -hmm. it was more slow. We'll go slow to go fast later. That's one yeah. DMM principle. But part of that is Jesus talking about the kingdom being like leaven in the dough. Mm -hmm. So in a context where people have never been to church, they've never read the Bible, they're not coming from a Judeo-Christian worldview, the question is, well, where do you start? Well, yeah. you got to back up. So that was another thing. I was discipled to start in the New Testament. Mm. We even did Bible translation projects. And where did we start? You start in the New Testament because we want to get quickly to Jesus. And I realized, wait a second, my audience here is not ready for that. I should back up and begin with, you know, in the beginning, you know, begin with where the scriptures start, do a storing approach, more relational, more small groups sitting on the floor and and then it was more like home church meaning like small group type of yeah. thing so most everything i was used to in an organized church and that's wonderful praise god for you know thousands upon thousands of you know registered churches around the world where we can do that but everything i was used to doing in that context or model completely not able to do any of that when i was in afghanistan John, I, I, I want to stay in the story of Afghanistan, but I want to take just a quick commercial break and go to the side over here, because I think, you know, what you're talking about there has some applications here for most of our listeners who are probably in America today, too, because there are a lot of people who will walk in the doors of our churches in a kind of a traditional way, but then there's a lot who never will. And let me ask you, do you think there's some application for what you picked up there in Afghanistan that translates to American context today as well? I, I do, Stephen. I really do. I mean, here we are in postmodern America, you know, post-Christian context, you know, a generation being raised up without the knowledge of God, very mm -hmm. little understanding of Scripture. So to me, it would be the same, similar. Relationally, mm -hmm. I've met someone at the basketball court, you know, or the laundromat or at Walmart or something related to my kid's school or yeah. something related to work that I'm doing. And I'm just going to naturally start asking questions, you know, trying to get to know them, maybe ask, you know, is there a way I could pray for you or maybe a way I could serve you or just to find out where they're coming from 
you know, in terms of faith things, in terms of, you know, worldview. And then the next step might be, hey, could we get together again for coffee? In this case, it's coffee. For us, it was mm -hmm. tea, you know, yeah. but could we get together again for coffee. I'd love to share more with you if you're interested in talking about whatever it is, family, love, money, whatever the context, you know, that we connected in, in that first conversation. And then naturally or, you know, relationally, we mm -hmm. would take it from there, maybe to, to involve their family or involve their friends or kind of like, I know some of the listeners are aware of Discovery Bible Studies. Mm -hmm. When we do that, that's one of the questions, you know, can I go share with someone or is there someone else you know who might be interested? So I, I do believe that type, that type of approach of making disciples kind of organically starting from scratch may be very, much more applicable now in 2022 than any other time in, in the United States, yes. Yeah, we're, we're in this mindset. And again, we just we actually had this conversation as a church uh, just yesterday about getting outside, yeah. right? Not not inviting people to a church, but it, inviting them to a relationship with Jesus. And that isn't, you know, because I think our culture, and you know, you mentioned that, you know, getting saved at a Billy Graham crusade, right? It's, it's this huge come and see type yeah. moment, yeah. Yeah. whereas... Yeah you know, pastors are always trying to seal the deal, right? So mm -hmm. have you made a decision? Like, are you going to get saved right now? And it's kind of this, but, but especially in that context, it's very like, it, let me give you some context. I'm, I'm teaching through right now the, uh, the book of Acts, mm -hmm. you know, Paul would constantly go to the synagogues, right? They already had a base knowledge of Messiah, Old Testament, the, the, the covenants, they, yeah. they, they had a base understanding. They just needed to know that Jesus was the guy. Mm -hmm. He's the one we've been waiting for. So there was already kind of that base context. Yeah. But then there was those times where they didn't want it. They wanted to attack him. And he's like, <laughs> I'm done with you. I'm going to the Gentiles. And so he had to start from scratch. And that's what I see what John's doing. Like this just total yeah. from scratch. Don't even know where people are at. And just starting. Because it, it even says there's a couple of times when he would go teach and it said he taught for weeks. He just yeah. kept going back. And sometimes they said, hey, come back. Mm -hmm. And he would go back and he would just mm -hmm. plug away, not trying to get everyone to make a decision to a certain yeah. extent, but allowing them to explore, allowing yeah. them to ask questions, right. uh, birthing the process in their heart first and let the Holy Spirit do the cultivating. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we're definitely yeah. seeing that take place in America. And I, I think part of it is, you know, what you alluded to, our churches. Uh, in a lot of ways, have become this kind of bottleneck to disciple making. We didn't mean for that to happen, but yeah. you know, that's in a lot of people's minds. That's where disciples are made is on Sundays, right? Mm. It's in that one hour. It's in that one building. It's on a Sunday, and we've got to really reverse that model and get people into the mindset that no, the disciple, the greatest asset we have disciple making is our disciples in our church right. that can go out in the communities Monday through Saturday. And uh, so I just, I wanted to take a detour there. I feel like that was important for us to say, but John, I, I want to come back to, um, to your context in Afghanistan. So you're, you're starting to teach these people. What is it? But I know every case is different, but what did it look like when people began to take that next step? You, I know you mentioned discovery Bible studies. Was that a tool that was a part of that? What, what did it, what did it begin to look like as they began to have their eyes open to the gospel as it were? Yeah. Well, no. So prayer was a big part of it. So like, for example, originally, you know, in the States, I was trained to knock on the door and you invite someone to church. So in this case, in every conversation in Afghanistan, we were looking for ways. Could I pray with you about that to show that we are, you know, the Deuteronomy six, the Shama lifestyle, that we love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that we're God seeking, you know, we fear God, we love God, we know God. And, and prayer was a big part of it. That was one of these, you know, paradigm shift things. Mm. People have seen me, you know, do this, these adjustments we make in the paradigm. The other thing was a creation to Christ approach. So it was a storing approach. So often I would say something like in a conversation, oh, that reminds me of a story. May I share the story with you? Mm. And well, in that part of the world, they love stories. So mm. they would say, yes, go for it. But it was mostly starting in the Old Testament stories, the creation stories, or Adam and Eve, or Noah, or, you know, Abraham, or, you know, Moses, Joseph, you know, some of those Old Testament, you know, prophets that they would find familiar, and that they would be kind of like doing a creation to Christ approach, similar to what, you know, Jesus did on the Emmaus Road when he 
He opened up their understanding of everything written about him in the law of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets. So it was more of this storing approach, kind of like a little bit of the, like I said, the leaven, you know, prayer mixed in that as well. And then when they wanted to know more, yes, we would sit and read the scriptures with them. But this was another big paradigm shift for me. Instead of me directly teaching, it was more facilitating discovery and discussions. You know, what do you hear God saying? And what does this mean to you? Or what do you like about this story? Regardless whether we were in the Old Testament or the New Testament. And it was, as we would say, it was journeying. It was kind of like going on a spiritual journey with them, you know, because the scriptures are like that. It's a journey from creation that leads to Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. and then beyond up to heaven, you know. Yeah. And so it meaning it would it would take a little bit longer. It was not, hey, are you ready to pray the prayer? You know, are you ready to become a Christian? Or yeah. you know, can I show you the Romans road? It was none of that unless they initiated it. Mm. So some of the listeners would know that God's revealing himself, you know, with dreams and visions to Muslims all over the world. Right. So sometimes, like the Nicodemus story, we would have people come and ask questions. And it was obvious God had been speaking to that person. He had been drawing them and mm. stirring up eternity in their heart and, you know, pricking their conscience and, you know, like a God awakened this type of thing. And, you know, persons of peace is kind of what we would call them. So in that case, when it was obvious, there was more revelation, you know, given to them by God. God was speaking to them and drawing them. Yeah. Well, we might go a little bit faster or we might go, you know, to a story about Jesus, but often it was starting relationally asking questions, almost like trying to deconstruct their Muslim worldview mm -hmm. and all these stereotypes that they have and all these strongholds that they have, you know, towards the gospel or towards Christ by asking them questions, telling them stories, getting them in the scripture, you know, them seeing our life and our love and hospitality, you know, how we honor them and trying to learn their language and culture. And, and um, so then yeah, if they would express interest, like you back to your question, I mean, real spiritual interest, then slowly, of course, we would get, you know, to what we would talk about more gospel stories, you know, about the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, you know, of course, the resurrection. But we would still go at the pace based on how it seemed God was working in their life. Yeah. And so that the fruit would be right instead of me trying to make something happen or, you know, trying to. You know, use use a method or approach that would be going too quickly, you know, based on where they're, you know, and, and I don't know if you've heard people say this, it's not original me, but sometimes, and back to your question earlier, even in America, the gospel, meaning the, the hardcore death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, that's like a 10 ton truck mm. over a footbridge for people nowadays that don't have a Judeo-Christian worldview. Yeah. The gospel's like taking a 10 ton truck over a footbridge. It's not ready. You got to build up some of the foundation, mm. you know, kind of like a creation to Christ approach or a discovering process, or like Jesus walking with the disciples for sometimes over a year before he would ask them, Hey guys, who do you, who do you say that I am? Yeah, you know, type yeah. of a deal. And, um, man, so, that and then is, we would be, we would be so trusting <laughs> the spirit of God and trusting the word of God in that, you know, in that process. Um, there's, I, I think there's so many things there so many things. Um, that, again, are applicable to us today. Yeah. But, John, I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing is what comes to my mind is not a, a mass production approach to disciples or to discipleship, but a customized approach mm. to discipleship. Um, discipleship or where disciples are custom built rather than mass right. produced. Uh, right. which it's I not think, an assembly line. It's not an assembly line. No which is not how Jesus dealt with it no, not and at all. probably has application for us today here in our context. For sure, yeah. for sure. You know what, John, especially as you're saying that, there's you, you, you said something that just struck me. you got to wait until the fruit is ripe, mm. right? And again, Jesus used all, all throughout yeah. you know, parables about uh, farming and harvesting, and, and you know, there's so much about planting and sowing and, and, and reaping, and yeah, you don't ever want to harvest before it's right. But I, I just love that kind of the inquisitive approach. Yeah. But you, again, and I think sometimes we do it here as well. We we don't recognize because the 
even in the Judeo-Christian, you mentioned it before, that we're in a postmodern, post-Christian culture, the footbridge has lost a lot of uh, stability. Mm -hmm. And so we're ramming through because we were raised with it. So therefore, right. everyone has a working knowledge. They've got at least an understanding when they may not yeah. at all. And so they're just turned off with this awkward story about somebody rising from the dead. You're nuts, dude. Yeah. Like, man, this is a cult or whatever. Or, or they sign up for something that they don't fully understand right. what they're signing up for, right? Yep. And, and and that's, I think, probably just as dangerous. Yeah. Is that something that you guys experienced there? Did you, did you have times where people were just kind of flippantly ready to become a Christian, or does the culture kind of create its own filter against that? No, the way we would respond to that is kind of like the four soils, you know, in the parable that mm. that plays out in mm. any culture. So in our context, we learned again this the hard way. You know, we learned from mistakes the hard way that sometimes people would show spiritual interest because they wanted a job. You know, they wanted to go to America or mm -hmm. they wanted to learn mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. Now, God's bigger. He's sovereign. He can even work through those motives, sure. you know what I'm saying, and really convict someone and bring them to faith in, in Christ. But back to your question, we did find at times there were some that really were not, as we would say, they were not in it to win it. They really weren't in it, <laughs> right. you know, to follow to follow Jesus. But, you know, th then as some of the some of the listeners would, would know about this, with this disciple-making approach, Somewhere in the journey, you know, we had friends coach us that were, I mean, they were very, they were just very committed to this particular approach of disciple making using discovery Bible studies. And they helped us realize that this can be a filtering process when we talk about these four words that are the key to a discovery Bible study, along with, you know, the Thanksgiving and a challenge and a prayer. But the, the, the Bible time, it's what did you hear? What did you learn? How would you obey and who will you share with? And so week by week, when we saw that people were really not engaging on those four main principles, mm. it became pretty obvious that they were just doing it for social reasons, you know, or fellowship reasons or language reasons or other motives of wanting to get a job or go to the West. But contrary, when you hear someone talk about yeah, this week I learned and they give something clearly that's scriptural, you know, biblical that God revealed to them. And they talk about, you know, this week I put this into practice and this is what God did. And this week, you know, you're not going to believe this, but God opened up the door and I shared with someone. And now I'm going to start a discovery Bible study with them. When you hear stuff like that, you regardless of how their motive may have been to get started, you know, God's at work in their life. He's working, you know, the spirit is working, you know, in their you know, in their, in their lives. And that's where we would say that's can be, you know, a picture of good soil or a person of peace mm -hmm. or like the second Timothy, where Timothy says, you know, to, to Paul says, I'm sorry, Paul says to Timothy, you know, you invest in others as yeah. I've invested in you, you invest in those who are going to be faithful to invest in others. Right. And, and so we had people that coached us in disciple making that were helping us to realize that even a few weeks in a relationship with someone, you can discern and discover, you know, in prayer, but in the practical relationship, are they really in this to be disciple to Jesus? Or do they have some other, you know, reasons like, you know, like Simon, the sorceress who saw mm -hmm. the power of God and wanted it for money, you know, type yeah. of a deal. You with, yep. you with me? That's yeah, good. absolutely. That's you know, good. let me ask you one more question. Um, and I know, I kind of know the answer in general, um, but I want to ask you in specifics. I love, obviously, we're here because of the gospel, right? We're here because of what Jesus did in our hearts, our lives, uh, revolution, revolutionized us uh, from, from the inside out. But when it comes to watching someone go from death to life, when that light bulb moment happens, when it's, again, whether it's a process or a moment, um, I love hearing stories about that. Could you share with us maybe just one of those moments, one that maybe sticks out in your brain of yeah, watching absolutely. someone uh, that was, you know, uh, just dead to their sins. And then just when you saw that kind of spark in their heart, when you saw the Holy Spirit begin to work um, to where they were transformed. Yeah. Well, one, it's a lot of stories, I but bet. I'll, I bet. I'll, I'll tell the story of, uh, of MP3. MP3, long story short, 
he learned most of the Bible from an MP3 player. That's mm. why he's called uh, MP3 because he couldn't read or write. And uh, so when we saw the spirit of God move in his life, I mean, it was, it, 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 again, it was just amazing that here's, here's an illiterate man hungry for the Lord. The Lord reveals himself to him. There were some answers to prayer. There was a dream and a vision, but there was a lot of discovery from the word because he's listening to it over mm. and over and over again. And to see him transformed, I mean, it was it, it just it it was amazing. Uh, another guy will will just call him Steve. We were doing the, like a discovery Bible study with him, and he had brought his cousin and brought a nephew, and we're just slowly, organically, you know, doing this. And I wish I could tell you the long story because sure. at that time we only we only had the New Testament. I wanted to start in John. They thought we should start in Matthew because that's where the New Testament started. And we're reading the genealogy. So back to your question, Dan. Sure. You can see light bulbs, the spiritual light bulbs going off in their mind <laughs> just as they're reading the genealogy, going all the way back to the very, very beginning. But unique to this brother was one day he asked me, and we were sitting in a group, could I pray? Well, in a Muslim context, it's very common to pray. We're praying all the time. You know what I'm saying? Scriptures say pray without ceasing. We were praying all the time. But he prayed, and the essence of what he prayed in his language was, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to give you thanks, and we thank you for this food that we're about to eat. And he would just went off, and I had never <laughs> asked him. No one had ever, you know, invited him to church. You know, no one. I mean, people had worked with him. We had shared with him in the work, but but to see that transformation take place, and then in his case, of course, uh, when, later when I got married, uh, and not just his wife, but other wives, when they shared with my wife the stories of the transformation of these guys. I mean, it, that, that just blew us because there's so much of their life we wouldn't see mm. because of the segregation of culture and gender. And so when we saw even some family transformation, mm. that's when we really knew God's really uh, up to something. And so, um, gosh, that, anyway. that's gotta be able to keep you going for a while. Cause that, when that fruit shows up. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, exactly. and, and yeah. John, you know, we've read and we've heard stories about disciple making movements, you know, predominantly not in America, sadly, but, you know, in Middle Eastern countries and in China and different places. But you, you had the opportunity to experience uh, some of that there. Right. Um, yeah. And I wonder we just got maybe a few minutes, but could you just touch on some of that? Maybe explain. You mentioned earlier DMM. Um, could you just explain what DMM is and, and maybe share an experience from mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so DMM is disciple making movements. So we all know the phrase disciple making or making disciples. Mm -hmm. But, you know, obviously, when Jesus says make disciples of all nations, and he's implying that's going to happen throughout generations and throughout yeah. all different ethnic groups, obviously, he means a disciple making movement. Of course, in the context of doing that among a people, there, some of the, you know, common language that's used is, it's beyond four generations, and there's multiple streams that results in hundreds and eventually thousands of new believers or new followers of Christ. And the, the four generations primarily comes from Paul pouring into Timothy. He told him to pour into others who would pour into others. And so usually when something goes from one generation to the next, to the third, to the fourth, it's it's not proven that it's unstoppable, but it's kind of hard to stop it mm. once it has, mm. you know, generated or reproduced that way. And so when we're talking about DMN, we mean disciple making in a way that could lead to a movement, multiple streams of, of disciple making. And so in our context, again, there was not a local church, you know, context. There wasn't, you know, official you know, church presence in that way. So organically, it spread from family to family or house to house. And the, the, the engine of it is kind of like a discovery Bible study. So that would become more of the heart of these gatherings. But then every week in obedience and in sharing, everyone's involved. And then it's like, we call it rabbit churches. It multiplies mm. kind of like rabbits do. We sure. actually had rabbits we actually had rabbits when we lived in Afghanistan, but, <laughs> and, and they do reproduce. And uh, uh, to whereas know. traditionally the model is an elephant model, which is bigger than better, you know, more mm. is better. But in disciple making movements, we're saying no, less is best, and uh, small is good, and, and and simple is good because it's easier to 
to reproduce. And Amen. so it's, it's an organic way of trusting the Spirit of God and the Word of God, similar to what Jesus did, starting with small groups and then training them and then launching them so they multiply more small groups and then organically it creates a movement, which is really what Jesus did. He started with a handful of guys and he launched a disciple making movement and he's asking us to, to continue that. Amen. Amen. John, if anybody wants more information about your story and just uh, some of your ventures, uh, how can they learn more about what you've done? Yeah. So you, all three of my books are on Amazon. So just quickly to give that promo, Amazon, I'm not promoting Amazon, but Amazon.com. Sure. You could just type John Weaver, Afghanistan, and, and three books are going to come up. One's called Inside Afghanistan. One's called A Flame on the Front Line. We also are on social media with the tag Weaver. That's my last name, Weaver United. And uh, so probably could find me just by Googling Weaver United or go on Amazon and type Afghanistan, John Weaver, and those books will pop up. Awesome. John, I listen, we're going to have to have you back because there's so many more questions I have. Like, I just want to sit down and chat with you for at least a day and a half. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, what, a, what a treat to hear all that God's doing around the world. Uh, just thanks for spending the time with us today. Yeah. Thanks, John. No, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Stephen. Blessings to you and all the listeners as well. May God continue to multiply you know, his work in and through all of us. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. Thank you guys for joining us on this episode of the Bonhoeffer Project podcast. If you want any more information on how to turn leaders into disciple makers, check out thebonhoefferproject.com, and that's what we do. And as we always say, listen, fulfill the Great Commission, make disciples, and let Jesus build the church. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.